Hi, my name is Nicolas Sarqueros, and I'm one of the core contributors to Milcomeda. And also with us, I'm Robert Kordaki, also one of the core contributors, more focused on the design and implementation standpoint. Thank you, Rob. And today we have uh, some big news for you. And uh, I, we thought that this would be it's such a special occasion that would be good to actually record a video about this because uh, we would like to announce that we were able to do an implementation of a rollup in Algran. So this is quite big news in a uh, quite big milestone for Milcomeda and even maybe uh, in the general crypto ecosystem because like rollups right now, they have been only constrained to in Ethereum. And as far as we know, maybe we're like the first rollup outside Ethereum. And uh, to maybe understand more about why is this important, let's start from the very basic. What's a rollup? Maybe Rob, you can tell us a little bit. What is it? What is a rollup? And maybe what is the difference with a sidechain? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, a great question. So with sidechains, this is something that you know was really hyped up more in the 2017, 2018 era, when initially we had, uh, you know, these really nice, uh, exciting L1s coming out. And then people were thinking, how do you expand the functionality? And there's been some different directions with how you do that. And one of the first ones was sidechains, which is effectively creating a second chain, which may or may not use the same base token as the main chain. And you use a the same or a different validator set to run that sidechain. Typically, these sidechains have a smaller validator set, and so it's usually much cheaper. And usually these sidechains may have different mechanisms for choosing who is a validator. But effectively, the sidechain is cheaper to run because it's smaller validator set, uh, and so typically they might be faster, they're usually less decentralized. And you have that trade-off where you have lower security because you don't have uh, in a proof of stake protocol, you don't have as much stake in the side chain uh, that is protecting the protocol. And so you have decreased security, but typically you have uh, faster speed or and or lower transaction fees because you make that trade off between security and not being on the L1. Uh, L1 meaning the main chain. In rollups, which is kind of the next step forward in scaling, this is where we get into L2s, layer twos. So L1 is the base chain, and then we have the L2s on top, which allow you to expand the abilities of the base chain of the L1, but while maintaining many of the security properties. So as we mentioned, a side chain is completely distinct and separate from the main chain. And what that means is that when a block is produced on the side chain, that doesn't mean a block is produced on the main chain. So they're actually distinct. And so the history and the sequencing of these two are not intertwined. And there's some ways to try and make them more intertwined and commit from the side chain to the main chain, but it's never perfect. It's just still two distinct systems with maybe some ways to really bridge from them, but it's not a full uh, bridge that is truly interoperable. So you always have this mismatch. Rollups, as I mentioned, is an L2 solution which actually maps onto or maps on top of the L1, the base chain. And so in practice, what that means is that we get to maintain many of the security properties of the L1 while still getting new benefits like scaling or getting new interoperability benefits, which is one of the things we're focusing on with Mokomida, is not focusing on rollups as primarily a scaling mechanism, though that's still in play, we're more focused on using rollups as a way to have an alternative VM, virtual machine, or an alternative execution environment for smart contracts, for projects that want to build in you know, quality L1 ecosystems, but which might have barriers to entry, whether from a programming smart contract uh, language perspective, whether that's a specific parts of the system which may be hard for someone to learn or maybe they don't want to learn because they're used to the EVM and Ethereum where a lot of contents and material is for learning about smart contracts, dApps, and really building stuff in blockchain. And so what we're doing with Molcomeda now, specifically with this very first deployment of a rollup on Algorand, is taking a lot of the security benefits of Algorand and rather than just having a sidechain, which throws away those security benefits, 
We try to actually benefit from those and we use that with our rollup on top, which is bringing EVM support. And so we try to have kind of the best of both worlds where we increase the interoperability, potentially have some scaling benefits, uh, depending on um, how much we can start to compress that data. This is something we're looking into, but it's not top priority. As we mentioned, scalability is something that's kind of like second tier for us in regards to what our rollups are aiming for. But suffice to say, uh, rollups, and specifically what we're building with our rollups for Mokomera, allow us to bring the EVM into non-EVM compatible ecosystems, or rather than a side chain where we throw away the security benefits of the L1, we actually get to take advantage of those and have deeper interoperability as an L2 on top of the L1. And so that's what we're doing with Mokomera, and that's why rollups are a big step forward from side chains. And overall, uh, it's something that we're really excited for, and we're happy you know, to be here telling you guys today what we're releasing. Um, that's a really good explanation, and like, uh, related to where the information from like this roll up, uh, I understand now like uh, from the explanation, like how they're like more secure. So this means that uh, like the data, everything that's happening in this like EVM layer two is actually being uh, written to the Algram blockchain itself. Uh, what is the data availability uh, with this? What is data availability? If you can tell us a little bit about this. Yep. So to take the first step back, data availability is, for those who don't know, uh, effectively the concept that if you and a group of people in a peer-to-peer -peer protocol commit to doing something, if you can't uh, fetch the data that proved that you did something, so for example, if I signed a message and Nico and I both knew I signed that message on my computer, but then I didn't send that message to anyone else, that message doesn't exist from the global state perspective, from consensus perspective. And remember, um, in blockchains, we're always focused on global sequence states. And so if we can't reproduce something that happened, it effectively doesn't exist. And that's a really big problem because when you start to build protocols, which says everyone knows I commit to something, which I commit to some data, if we can't retrieve that, then I didn't commit to it officially. And this effectively is a big hole that runs in blockchain protocols, which attempt to do L, which attempt to create L2s or even on L1, uh, a core part of a blockchain, even Bitcoin is data availability. The data availability is baked into the protocol itself, where in Bitcoin, for example, every node intends to replicate all data of every block. In the L2 scene, whether that's on Ethereum, Cardano, or any other L1 blockchain with smart contracts, or Algorand specifically, obviously that's what we're focusing on now. When you have a, an L2 that is intending to be on top, like a rollup, we need data availability, which means that the data which is being sequenced by the L1, so that's where you get a lot of the security properties, is that the validator set of Algorand is sequencing the transactions of the rollup for us. So that means we know I paid Nico $10 and then Nico paid me $5 after. And that sequencing is what's really important about blockchain is what happened in which order is actually one of the most important parts. And then the second part of that, which is uh, Algorand's doing the sequencing for us, but then what does the data availability? And specifically, we're also leaning on Algorand to do the data availability. So not only is Algorand uh, guaranteeing that I paid Nico first and then Nico paid me, but it's also guaranteeing I paid Nico $10 and Nico paid me $5. And so we guarantee the ordering sequencing and we guarantee the data availability. So they know what happened, not just the order of Robert did something, Nico did something, but we know the full story. And so with Mokomera, uh, with the rollups we're doing specifically with the A1 rollup, the Algorand rollup, we are using Algorand for both sequencing, which is what rollups have to do, and data availability. So what that means is that we're posting all A1 data on Algorand itself. And we came up with a new protocol for this to get around a lot of uh, transaction size constraints. And we use uh, something called like a Merkleized batching scheme that we came up with, which maybe we can talk about later on in this video. But suffice to say, uh, we're starting off leaning into Algorand and a lot of the benefits it has is a quite solid L1. 
and we're using it thus for sequencing data availability. However, something key to note for those who are more L2 uh, educated and know more about this area, this doesn't mean we're locked into this, and this doesn't mean we can't in the future look at either for A1 or maybe a future Algorand rollup, look at using other data availability schemes to then have better scaling benefits, lower costs. And so the approach we're taking now is to have high security, uh, get something that works really well in the short term, which relies on Algorand as an L1 to really provide all the benefits. And then as the rollup grows, we can really start to look at what's the latest, greatest in data availability schemes. Are we gonna maybe look at Celestia? What kind of Validiums? You know, look at all the different data availability approaches, and then we can have the ability to kind of scale and move forward as the industry grows and we can see what are the best solutions. Wow, really cool. And <clears throat> something that I wanted to ask you is so if you can tell us a little bit more about like the properties of Algorand that makes this like actually like easier to implement, for example, about finalities, there's something like interesting there that actually makes like uh, implementing rollups uh, having like a better UX for users and people mm -hmm. are going to be using them. Yep. So um, Algorand has something that's really nice, especially as a, a developer or a company who's looking to build on top of Algorand on like an L2, L3, L4 level, or, you know, whichever level you want to go up the stack. Um, effectively, when you look at blockchains, say like the most popular blockchains everyone knows, you have Bitcoin and you have Ethereum, for example. Both of these have uh, non-deterministic finality. And what that means is that technically it's always possible for the blockchain to go back into the past and go into a different route of history. And I won't go into the long specifics of why this may be the case, because we're not doing a full you know, lecture about consensus for two hours here. Uh, but it's nice to say, effectively, with these probabilistic or non-deterministic finality systems, there's always a possibility where a fork can happen at some point in the history, in the past of the blockchain. And then a rollback happens. So where everyone thinks the history is going in route A, but then it reverts back to some points and instead goes route B. And so for example, say with the example I said before, where I gave Nico $10 and he gave me $5, it's theoretically possible for uh, a blockchain which has non-deterministic finality or probabilistic finality, also another name, is for uh, me to spend the $5 in block uh, height N, uh, sorry, uh, spend the $10 to Nico, and then Nico would send it to me in block N plus one, but then there'd be a rollback back to block N. And so from my perspective, oh, we're you know initially all good, but then it reverts back and then suddenly I pay Nico, but Nico didn't pay me. And so this is a problem because you have to effectively design all your protocols, all your L2s, your rollup and everything with the realization that, hey, people, the end users will have a worse experience because you don't have a guaranteed finality. So you constantly have to build with this probabilistic finality in mind. And so typically that's why when you send, um, you know, uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum to exchanges, they tell you, you need at least X number of confirmations. These are the number of confirmations where they feel most likely probabilistically they're safe. They have your funds. There won't be a rollback with Algorand just to bring this all back to why we're talking about this in the first place, we have instant finality. And so that means once, your transaction is accepted in a block on chain, then it's just there. It works. I don't have to worry. I don't have to think. I don't have to count how many confirmations. It's just there. It's final. And so that gives us a lot of benefits because now we don't have to go through the UX problems, but we also don't have to start worrying uh, about how we start to build on top. And with rollups, we do have some flexibility. So this is also one of the benefits of rollups is that they're more uh how would you say it? agile in an environment with probabilistic finality but thanks to algorand's uh, instant finality we don't have to even worry about any of these problems and so we get to build up the infrastructure and we get to have and something of interest actually is that because ethereum for example has probabilistic finality and rollups on ethereum inherit the same security properties therefore we have something that's actually completely new in the Algorand EVM rollup, which we're deploying, A1. 
because we have an EVM system with instant finality. That's something that never was possible before because there was no L1 with EVM rollups that had instant finality. This is something I believe the Ethereum Foundation or some researchers are looking at for implementing a finality gadget into Ethereum in the future, but it's not there today. And so what's kind of exciting is from our perspective, our A1 rollup will probably be the first EVM implementation uh, as a rollup that's not a sidechain that has actual instant finality. And so these are really novel traits from the L1, which kind of, you know, bubble up into the higher layers, which is really one of the exciting parts of rollups compared to sidechains. Uh, so Rob, I wanted to ask you about like, uh, I remember when we were working on the numbers and we were implementing the rollup, one of the first numbers that we got because there's like some limitations because of like the transaction signing uh, chaining that we will hit like, I don't know, six, seven transactions per second. But we, what you already hinted, we were able to implement a protocol that would like increase like how, the throughput. Can you tell us a little bit more and like maybe a feeling of like how much we were able to get uh, through this uh, to get a feeling of how fast this rollout could be? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, effectively one of the limitations we ran into with Algorand in the beginning is that transactions are actually quite limited in size. And so it's by default, Algorand was not designed, you know, back uh, in the beginning to just be this place where you dump tons of data. That wasn't like the concept of a blockchain initially. Like no one from Bitcoin to, you know, anywhere in the past, you know, or sorry, in, anywhere in the first eight years of blockchains really visualized the blockchain as a place where you dump data because the realization of blockchains as primarily sequencing and data availability solutions wasn't really realized. It was just kind of implicit in the selling point of global consensus. And so what we ran into is that we took um, kind of the most basic or most obvious approach, maybe not the most basic, but the most obvious approach of how we would go about integrating or implementing a rollup on top of Algorand. And we came up with, I think, uh, 6.34, 6.33 uh, transactions per second is what we could hit, which is terrible, obviously. Um, and so the reason why, as I mentioned, is there is strict uh, size limitations to the transactions themselves. And there is some, in Algorand, you have the ability to group transactions. So you can have uh, classically in blockchains, if you sign a transaction, the block producer gets to choose how that transaction is ordered. And so if you sign three transactions, you could do you know, A, B, C, but the block producer could choose to order them as B, C, A. And, or you could do B, C, wait three blocks, and then uh, commit A. And so you have this problem where uh, transaction sizes are small. You have a lot of data you want to commit. So the naive solution is, okay, do a lot of transactions. But then you have a limitation of, you can't order them properly or you don't have a guarantee. And so if a block producer is adversarial, he can break your protocol. Uh, Algorand has one step forward from that where they have group transactions. So you can do, I believe, up to 16 transactions, which all must be commit together in one block. So unlike normal transactions, which uh, you have no way to link together in these groups of 16, all 16 must be in the same block and unless they are, any individual of those 16 is an invalid transaction. And so that gives us you know, 16 times the throughput. And that's awesome. However, that still only allowed us to arrive at six uh, transactions per second. And so what we had to do is kind of figure out, okay, Algorand has instant finality. It can be an awesome data availability solution for sequencing. So how do we go about unlocking the you know, solid networking that's been put in place but we you know, try and work around some of the existing limitations and also kind of take into account what's up in the future um, in regards to the upcoming Algorand roadmap and how can we kind of optimize so that, uh, you know, well, for the short term, we definitely don't have 60 BS, but definitely hundreds to the thousands. And how do we make sure that we can optimize so that as Algorand keeps increasing uh, transaction sizes, block sizes, the total throughput of the network itself and doing better peer to peer and you know doing the full uh, improving the full networking stack how do we take advantage of that and so 
uh, we went to the drawing board, pulled out whiteboard, you know, drew for a few hours, thought of stuff through. It's pretty simple to understand and it's not too hard to implement, but there's a few points of, um, few edge cases, you may say, which need to be taken into account to really have the protocol work. But effectively, what we figured out is that we can easily commit to batches. So a rollup is a set of transactions that get posted onto a blockchain and again, sequenced uh, on the blockchain and has a data availability solution. And in our uh, circumstance, we kind of have almost a validium style posting of batches initially because we have a batch proposal phase and a batch submission phase and so this has two benefits a that it allows us to scale on algorand today but it also prepares us for a future where we might even want a different data availability solution and we're already kind of half of half of the way there in regards to splitting up the sequencing which is kind of the batch uh, submission or sorry batch proposal and the batch submission which is the data availability and so we inherently separate those two parts and effectively what this allows us to do is first to submit one transaction that says, hi, I'm a sequencer. I'm posting this large batch of transactions. We commit to that batch as a Merkle root of the batch and also uh, specifying how many uh, parts of the batch there are. Once that is committed to Algorand, we have this finality. So you know that same block we see it on the chain it's there the very next block and however many blocks in the future needed we have the ability to then post all of the pieces of the batches we get to take advantage of the 16 group transaction size limits that algorand has and so effectively we submit a proposal for a batch it gets accepted then we submit you know one to a full block of algorand transactions filled with these 16 group batches of transactions, each one being a chunk of the batch of EVM, the L2 transactions that go onto the rollup. Once every single uh, piece of the batch that's based off of the Merkle uh, roots that's posted in the proposal phase is posted in the submission phase, then we have the batch finalized because once again, we have instant finality. And so we have this nice uh, experience where we don't have to even have um, extra time in between batches, you know, waiting on uh, there's scenarios where, for example, sequencers might want to save on transaction fees, especially if, you know, blockchains get very congested, if you have probabilistic finality, because you don't have a guarantee the previous batch is committed. And so if you try to build on the previous batch and that previous batch gets reverted, well, you might lose money. And so one of the nice things is with the instant finality, we get to have a uh, more steady throughput in regards to as soon as a batch is proposed, as soon as it's submitted, then the next one instantly can be proposed after. Or even technically, uh, once we optimize stuff, when uh, a batcher knows they're submitting the final part of the batch, they can already propose the next batch in the exact same block. And so you can even have like a zero downtime where you're almost in a pure submission phase. And then you go from you know batch N, and at the very last block where you're submitting parts of the batch in the submission phase, you put the proposal for the next one, and then you're already in batch n plus one. And so there's a lot of optimizations effectively uh, that we're working through. And um, all of it together has uh, us looking around in the thousands of TPS uh, for the uh, A1 Algorand rollup. Once Algorand does uh, some new and upcoming updates to their uh, networking, uh, transaction size limits and all of those parameters, as I mentioned. And so we're really excited because we went from six TPS, which is you know unacceptable for a smart contract platform uh, of any kind, really. And so now moving into the thousands of TPS, you really start to see a lot of benefits. And it's quite exciting to see how, you know, using the native uh, features of Algorand, we were really able to get to that kind of scale. Thank you, Rob. That's a good explanation. Hopefully everyone now understands more about like the optimizations that we came out to like be able to have like a better data availability protocol for everything that's related to like the transactions from uh, the batch of the transactions from the rollup. So right now we have talked about rollups, uh, why they're better than sidechains, the security implications, decentralization of like the rollup itself. And we 
now know that we rely on the decentralization of Algorand itself, which is like pretty cool. Uh, so we talk about like uh, about like the expectation of uh, about, for example, like the speed that we can get and how we can like benefit from upcoming improvements to the Algorand protocol. And what I want to ask you, like, besides like allowing uh, developers to deploy uh, uh, solidity smart contracts and bring everything that's related to the EVM ecosystem, is there anything else that we can get from this? Can we be used as a like maybe sort of like an adapter for like all the type of technologies? Is it like just this, or can we help integrating all the things as well with all the work that we are doing? Yeah, that's a good question. So one thing I alluded to very briefly um, in the intro to this is that not only do we have L1s and L2s, but you have three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and two infinity, theoretically. And so what that means is that we have many potential layers on top of our L2, which is the A1 rollup. And so in practice, you know, most people might say, why would you ever do that, right? Like uh, you have a base layer and you have this new technology on top. Why would you keep on stacking? However, one of the innovative new approaches we've seen in both the Ethereum ecosystem, though this is primarily more in blog posts at this point, uh, L2s are so new that we don't really have this as a blockchain space, uh, you know, very mature L2s, let alone L3s or L4s. However, this is stuff that's already being researched into. And it's quite exciting because it's just as applicable for us as an Ethereum ecosystem. So what this means is that we have the Algorand uh, rollup as an uh, L2. And then on top of that, we get to take advantage of everything in the EVM ecosystem. So for example, we have zero knowledge rollups and zero knowledge technology, which not only enables technology, uh, sorry, not only enables rollups, but effectively allows anyone to make arbitrary proof claims about off-chain computation, computation on other chains, or computations of something that someone wants to submit onto uh, the blockchain, we get to take all those primitives, which primarily right now are all in the EVM ecosystem, because Ethereum is really pioneering there, but we get to take that and now bring that over to these new ecosystems like Algorand, where Algorand doesn't have to put in the likely millions and millions of dollars to just get the basic zero knowledge primitives on the layer one level, but instead can actually take advantage of all this work because thankfully much of blockchain is open source and a lot of this is available. You know, some, uh, I mean, some zero knowledge systems are not open source. And so obviously uh, it's more of uh, looking at what projects are really willing to expand out into other ecosystems. But there are quite a few that are interested and there's a lot of teams uh, that are up and coming. We're really excited in the zero knowledge space and so we're really looking forward to eventually reaching out to those people and seeing, you know, what are the potential possibilities of putting a ZK rollup on top of our rollup on Algorand that targets the EVM on our rollup, which is then on top of uh, Algorand L1 itself. And so we get to take the security properties of Algorand and kind of start to bump up some of those through the chain of different layers. And so really what we're excited to see is not that just, hey, you can copy and paste your solidity contracts into uh, our roll up, and then that's cool. That's in, uh, it's quite exciting to see, you know, DAP teams move over from existing EVM ecosystems into Algorand, for example. But we're also excited to have that technology. And once, you know, you have zero knowledge tech uh, able to be used on our roll up, it's also not crazy to imagine that eventually you'll have zero knowledge proofs also on Algorand, but it's not a direct priority. And so maybe you can have composable proofs between our. Uh, a, either an L3 running on top of our L2 or a, a, a solidity based ZK proving contract on top of our L2 that also interacts with a ZK proving contract on our L1. And you have proofs from the L1 Algorand and, and proofs from our L2 kind of uh, enabling novel bridges to take place and effectively new protocols to be in place, which leverage the benefits of both of Algorand and the EVM. Our opinion in general is that it's better to just kind of not go, uh, it, you know, the, between blockchains, you have some that go extremely fast and some that go extremely slow. We think there's benefits in both approaches, 
And there's no reason why not take the benefits of both. And so if today in the short term, or you know, in the next few months when we release A1 publicly, if we can take advantage of all the ZK tech and all the other exciting tech that's already being built in the Ethereum ecosystem, it doesn't make sense to just say, no, nah, we'll leave that to them and we'll recreate everything from scratch. I just don't think it's a very wise move overall. And from our perspective, we really do think it's best to bring that tech over to these new ecosystems like Algorand, start building all that up. And then as the tech matures, it can also make a lot of sense then in the future, maybe for Algorand to look at what zero knowledge primitives does it make sense to unlock new interoperability, to unlock new capabilities out of the chain, maybe for more efficient uh, data availability solutions or otherwise uh, on the L1 level. And so by taking a short term approach of trying to you know, bring over the current tech and seeing what works, what does well, and then giving Algorand the opportunity to then you know, go at a solid pace for what makes sense for the ecosystem itself. We think we get the benefits of both worlds. And we think from an end user perspective, this is what people are going to want because they want the nice shiny new tech, but you know, you don't have to shove that all into your L1. And so with that together, the trade-offs seem to make a lot of sense for us. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Rob. And uh, to start like wrapping up, I hope uh, that this uh, helped everyone to understand more about like what we were building. Uh, we know that sometimes this is like not so well known outside the Ethereum community because uh, they have been pushing for this and while other ecosystems have been pushing more of like optimizations in the layer one, but uh, a lot of the research now is pointing towards like layer two as an scalability solution. Obviously optimizing layer one helps a lot because uh, the stronger and the better the layer one is like the scalability of the layer two is going to be better because it acts as a multiplier. And we were able to also like sort of like hint on that when we were to, uh, talking about data availability. We, uh, we as we mentioned, we already have a demo on Algorand testnet working for a rollup, which is like really, really exciting. We are able to deploy smart contracts, ERC-20, and everything was like pretty good. So we are like really excited. We also have a bridge to move assets from Algorand to the uh, layer one, to the layer two, back and forth. And we hope to have a public testnet uh, sometime in June. Uh, so far, we have been hitting our milestones. Uh, congratulations to the entire team. Uh, they have been working really hard on this. And hopefully by July or August, I uh, think are well. Uh, we're going to have a rollup working in Algorand mainnet. Uh, we are like super excited about this and we're going to continue posting more information. And please let us know if you have any questions uh, that or like any other topics that maybe we can make a video. I don't know if Rob, you have any other comments before we wrap up? Uh, not really, but just to kind of um, get everyone excited. I think there's a lot of really new potential that we're going to start to see. And we hope that also from a rollup perspective, uh, we hope that, you know, obviously A1 does very well, our rollup does very well in Nolcomoda. Uh, really benefits the Algorand ecosystem. But I think it'll also be a great opportunity for people to see that, hey, you know, rollups can actually be quite awesome, even in these new ecosystems where they haven't been done before. And hopefully some of our uh, research we've done, like into how to uh, improve the throughput for posting batches or potentially other pieces of data onto Algorand uh, for L2 solutions. Uh, hopefully that can get reused by other projects in the future too. And so really what we want to do is keep building solid tech, keep help, helping to improve these ecosystems that actually have a you know, solid foundation that they put in the time and effort to build. And so we hope to take part in expanding that with some of the more recent and latest tech and you know, benefiting the ecosystem and all the users in it. Thank you, Rob. Uh, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone.